morning. How delightful to be all back again. To see your faces, at least half of them. And uh, to uh, be together in the name of Christ the Lord. Worship in His name. Now please open your hymn books and turn to the back where you'll find question 40 of the short catechism. Remember that there are two catechisms in the back of your hymn books. The first one is the shorter catechism, the second one is the Heidelberg. And if you're paging around trying to find which is which, you'll know it this way. Uh, the Heidelberg catechism refers to Lord's Day 1, Lord's Day 2, and so on intermittently. So if you've seen Lord's Days, you know you're in the Heidelberg catechism. If there's no Lord's Days, you're in the shorter catechism. That's a quick way to find it. Easier to use page numbers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, then I've got to announce it. <laughs> okay, yes, that's true. Okay, so that's, thank you, that's helpful. Which question So if someone can shout out the page number, question 40. Seven. Page seven. Seven. seven, thank you, well done. All right, uh, we'll wake the young men up. We'll have Joaquin read uh, question 40 and the answer, please. Now, boys. What did God at first reveal to man for the rule of his obedience? The rule which God at first revealed to man for his obedience for the moral law. Very good. Thank you. Let's pray. Our Lord, God, and Father, we thank you that we may spend this half hour this morning solemnly considering the wonderful subject of the law of Almighty God. Bless you that it is recorded for us on pages in print. We thank you that you first gave it on tablets of stone. We pray that we may come before you humbly this morning with faithful, obedient, fearful spirits. And grant, we pray, the work of your spirit to take place in our hearts this morning so that we may learn of you as true disciples of Jesus Christ, who came to fulfill this law. In his name we pray, Amen. Amen. Right, so then uh, we have already uh, looked a little bit at the uh, question of, at question 40, we've, we've made a little bit of progress, we started at the very beginning. Do you remember we asked the question, where does, does law come from? Where does it all start? Remember the answer to that? I didn't put it quite in those words, so you've got to do a bit of thinking here. Where does it all originate? In God. In God, yes. What, what was the answer? Sorry? In God. Okay, so, so uh, and, and particularly in the nature of God. Remember we said that the nature of a cat is one thing and the nature of a dog is another. Imagine um, throwing a ball for your cat to fetch it. Your cat is never going to fetch the ball. <laughs> your dog is. Um, and we said that because of God's nature is good, it is the nature of God to be good, to be holy, to be righteous, to be just, to be true. Um, then out of his nature flows all the laws that he has given. Uh, particularly his moral law, which is what our question is about, the moral law. Okay? Um, and why are we going right back to the beginning? Take a look at the question and the answer. Maybe, Luke, uh, you could uh, scrutinize the question there. There are two words that take us right back to the beginning. What are those two words? First revealed. Okay, yes, I, I was going to look at the words at first, so you, you're half right. Okay, at first. Okay, so what do these words at first mean? Does, does, it, does at first refer to the time when God first gave the Ten Commandments, in other words, at Mount Sinai? No, even before. Even before, yeah, it's taking us to the very beginning. Okay, man had some idea of the law of God right at the very beginning. Okay, and where did he get this from? Where did Adam and, and uh, Abel and 
and uh, uh, Sith and so on uh, get the law from? From God. And how did God give it to them? He spoke to them. No. Nope. He wrote it on their hearts. Yes, he wrote it on their hearts. Yes, God did speak to Adam in, in, in giving him the command about the tree of good and evil and, and so on. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, but, but what I was referring to last time was that the law is actually written on the hearts of men, and particularly written on Adam's heart, because uh, before Adam fell, that rule was perfect. Okay? And Adam knew good and evil. It was written on his heart. We looked at the scriptures that taught that, particularly Romans uh, chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Let me read it to you again as a reminder. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. Right, is, is your conscience the same thing as God's law? No, no my conscience responds to God's law. Right, your conscience uh, interacts with God's law. Right, it responds to God's law. And uh, the word conscience comes from uh, the Latin, which means to know with. Uh, so in other words, God's law is written on your heart. Your conscience then says, yes, I know that this is right. I know that this law written on my heart is right and true. Um, so you, the conscience is a function of your soul, right? It's not that you have a body and a soul and a conscience somewhere. No, no. Uh, your conscience is a function of your soul which uh, tells you that God's law is right and good and true. Okay. And the fact that our consciences accuse us or excuse us, uh, well, that's good because then your conscience is doing its job. Okay, it either excuses you when you've done what is good and right, or it accuses you when you've done what's wrong. And okay, our conscience doesn't always work perfectly uh, because we're fallen and we need to educate our consciences in the light of God's word, in the light of his law. And continually disobeying or ignoring your conscience will make it not work very well. Right, so that's a very important question there that uh, Molly has raised. What about when we ignore our conscience? Uh, when we deny so there's two things that we can ignore. We can ignore God's law that is written on our hearts or even His written law. And we can also squash our consciences. Right, so there's two forms of denying. Um, so uh, we know what's right and wrong. It's written on our hearts and man denies it. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's not a good thing. No. It's terrible. It's horrific. When we deny. What happens? What are you doing when you deny God's law? You put yourself above it. Yes. Yes. What else are you doing when you deny God's law? Perfect. Hardening your heart. Sorry, there are several answers to you. Hardening your heart. Heart, you're hardening your heart, yes, so it affects you, you're damaging yourself, yes, what else? Rejecting the Lord. Rejecting the Lord, exactly. You're kicking the Lord out. Okay, and that's the beginning of atheism, right? So you're practically an atheist when you squash God's law. And I think we hurt him because he's given the Lord for our benefit. Yes. Yes, it's, it's, it's for our benefit, so we're 
cutting off the supply of our, our benefit. Um, we're confusing, of course, also the difference between good and evil. We're beginning to, to say, well, it, you know, it's all one and the same thing. There is no law of God written on our hearts. We deny it, we, we throw it out, and then in the wake of that, good becomes evil, and evil becomes good. Have you, have you guys seen in school kids that, um, that don't have a good understanding of right and wrong? I they do. Like <laughs> you, you've got kids I've like, got that. One like that. You've got one like that, yeah. <laughs> you see kids doing things that are wrong, that are sinful, that are horrible, but they don't think, it's, they don't think of themselves as sinful and, and, and horrible and cruel and so on. They just do them. They haven't got an understanding of right and wrong because they've grown up since little in a family that has denied God's laws. So they grow up twisted and perverted. It's a horrible thing. Okay. Um, so then, we, we are speaking about uh, the laws that are written on, on our hearts, and these laws are in accordance with the nature of God. Uh, but let's think more particularly about the moral law. Okay, what do we what do we understand by the moral law? The Ten Commandments. Well, the Ten Commandments, Ten yeah. Commandments. Do you remember last time we said there were some laws that are always binding, and then some laws that are temporary? Well, the moral law is always and the ceremonial laws and things like that are not because they become obsolete in Christ. Yeah, you, you, I, I've got your point, yes. There are some principles of the ceremonial laws that are moral and, and the lasting. Alright? But yes, some of the details of the ceremonial law and so on are, are, were, were temporary. Um, so, yes, that's one simple and helpful way to understand what the moral law is. It's the law that's always, always binding. Can I ask something? Yes. But how did Cain and Abel know what sacrifice to bring? Which was the right and which was the wrong sacrifice? No, I also asked that. Yes. Okay, Jim was good. Yeah. I thought, I uh, uh, paused there because I knew he was going to say something. <laughs> May I suggest that the Westminster Shorter Catechism is a little bit um, bound in some of the medieval scholastic theology at this point. And I think it's always better to talk about God's law. Moral law seems to imply that God himself is also subject to this law because it's a category that often in theology was divorced from God as if it was just, you know, there. Um, and uh, I think what we need to understand is that Adam and Eve in the garden didn't possess some law. They possessed a complete knowledge of God himself and so of his character, sufficient for everything the Lord required them. They were not, you know, primitive in the garden. Uh, Adam was a genius. Uh, and... Um, so, we, we have to understand the early chapters of Genesis in light of the whole of the Pentateuch. Uh, you know, for example, so Cain and Abel in Genesis 4, they're bringing a, a, a tribute to God. It's not an atoning sacrifice. It's a mincha, it's a gift, it's an acknowledgement. Uh, but Noah in Genesis 8 offers burnt offerings to God, and the burnt offering was the most basic atoning sacrifice every day in the temple morning and evening twice on the sabbath two morning two evening on the sabbath and four morning four evening every new moon this was the the shape of israel so how did they know god revealed it to them okay um and so when we read in genesis 5 and 6 and then again in genesis 9 of man's appalling wickedness that every imagination, every thought of his heart is only evil all the time. That's very important. It's a complete rebellion against God. And so Romans 1 is a very fine understanding of that. 
So as someone said a little while ago, our rejection of God's law is our rejection of God himself. And that's what Cain is doing. Okay, that's why God is not pleased with him. It's not as if he was ignorant and he was just trying to do his best. Alright, that's why it's such a severe mm -hmm. sin. Such a terrible rebellion. Alright, so. And you see the pattern of Romans 1 in Cain, don't you? First he won't worship God. Then he will do all kinds of wickedness. And he kills his brother. Because he will not worship God. So, yes, so we accept that the catechism is helpful, you know, everything that it's saying. But sometimes it's helpful, I think, just to anchor ourselves in more clear biblical language. Um, and I think total depravity is very important here. The reason that pagan people and non-Christian people do good things is not because they have a partly good heart and a partly bad heart, okay? It's, we have completely bad hearts. It's God's common grace that restrains us from doing all the wickedness we might do. And it's God's common grace that brings His law to us, His love for us, His ongoing revelation to us. It's always from the Lord. So don't think of the moral law as something that's just out there. It's in terms of our living in the presence of God. Well, I hope that helps, sir. Uh, yeah, so, that's, no, that's great. Thank you. Cain and Abel got the law from God. So, in, in other words, um, to answer Marley, um, they knew, Cain and Abel knew what um, offerings to bring because God had spoken his revealed will to them. He had already told them this. Yes. And it wasn't a problem with what Cain brought. It's how he brought it. Okay, it's not the problem he brought fruit from the field. It's a perfectly acceptable mincha, alright? It's how he brought it. And the Lord was not pleased with him and so his sacrifice. It was first Cain. Cain's heart was the problem. That's why his sacrifice was not accepted. Okay. Amen. I think that's very, very important. I can't stress that too much because lots of commentators have misunderstood this and badly misunderstood it. But every commentator who pays attention to the Hebrew word for offering there, he gets it right. Everyone who just says, who thinks in terms of atoning sacrifice and misses the Hebrew word, they, they, they get into trouble there. Yeah. Yes, I've heard or read people who say uh, Cain should have bought quite a lamb from Abel to, to bring because yes. he should have bought a lamb. Yes. As, it, as you've explained, it's not the, not the right thing. It's, it was his heart, not, his, not, not the right. stuff. They're bleating up the wrong tree. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, he was bringing as a word, like we would bring our tithes. <laughs> Acknowledgement that everything we have is from the Lord. You should bring your offering with a cheerful heart, right? God loves a cheerful giver. If you begrudgingly give your tithe, oh, this is something you've got to do, the Lord won't accept you or your gift, okay? So think of the, that offering as the, the New Testament equivalent of the tithe or a, a gift to God to support His work. God doesn't need our money. He didn't need presents from Cain and Abel because that's a good translation of the word mincha, present, tribute, offering. Uh, he wanted their hearts. Yeah. All right, so everything God does is good. And everything He says is good. He can only do good and speak good. Right? And so when He makes Adam, how does He make Adam? Good. Good. He makes him upright. Yeah. Okay? Ecclesiastes 7, God made man upright. Mm. Simple. Common knowledge. Uh, it has to be that way. Because God is who He is. Okay. So uh, that's how Adam uh, is made. It's, it's built into him. Uh, okay. um, all right, so in Adam's case, because he had not yet fallen, it was as good as if God had given him especially spelled out, written um, set of laws. Uh, it was written on his heart, it was all there. Uh, okay, um, let's uh, ask the question, thinking now of God's law. 
we've said earlier on that it's our rule for obedience. Okay? How do you know what to what to do? Well, God's law is given to you as a rule for our obedience. So God, so, so that that answers the question: How do we obey God, or what must I do to obey God? Okay. Let's ask the question: Not just how or how I must or what I must do. Let's ask another question: Why? Why must I obey God? God's law. Because He's asked us to, and um, because He made us for that purpose, that we would obey and 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 then um, enjoy Him I mean, and and be be with Him. Okay, so yeah. let me address the, the, young, the, the, young, the three young men here. Um, question is, why must you obey God's law? And Auntie Monique has said, because God wants you to. Right? Is that right? Is that the right answer, do you think? Is that the answer you would have given? That's the right answer. Okay. <laughs> Good. Also, because we love him, not because we have to. Because we love him, yes, yes, that's that's true. But um, what in the case of somebody who doesn't love God? Doesn't he still have to do it? Yes, he does. You see, and why does he have to do it, even though he doesn't love God? Because God commanded. Commanded. Yes. God wants him to do it. But he is bound by the covenant of works, in where we are not. Okay, you're speaking very softly there. You go. Uh, I'm saying that the non believer is bound by the covenant of works. So his obedience is to his detriment, where ours is not. If that makes sense. Well, yeah, let me interpret you there and say that the unbeliever has sinned, right? And has broken all of God's law, and he will be damned and judged on account of it. Yeah. Okay. We all. Say again. We all have. And we all have. Yes. yes. And we all have. And but for God's rescuing us, we are finished. Good. Okay. So let me remind you of the way the Scripture words it: "I am the Lord your God." Okay. You've heard those words before. Yeah. They're repeated in the Scripture in connection with God's law. "I am the Lord your God." You shall therefore keep my statutes and judgments. It's because of who God is and what He wants you to do. So then, God's law, or what we are referring to as God's moral law, cannot be changed. It is binding for all times. Um, uh, and... Uh, And yet there are other commands of God that can be changed or altered because they are simply the commands of God's choice, not simply not, not the commands that are flowing from His nature. Okay? Um, but as far as man is concerned, so God may change His law. God may change His law. Do you agree with that? He does. Okay, he's done it very often. It's recorded in the Bible. And the ceremonial law of Mardi referred to as an example. He does. But as far as man is concerned, is man allowed to change God's laws? No. Definitely not. Definitely not. Okay. And that's why Jesus said, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Okay, so get that clear in your mind. God's law, you can't fill with it. But what about God? Let's take an example. Think of Abraham. What did God command Abraham to do? <laughs> Sorry, <take. laughs> to go out into the one country that he wanted to go to. Oh, that was the first, first, okay. The Lord drew a yes and? 
sacrifice Isaac? Yes, that's what I'm getting at, yeah. Sorry. No, there's many commands that instructions that God gave Abraham. Yes, I'm particularly referring to God uh, calling, uh, requiring Abraham to offer his only son Isaac. Now this is, there's a lot to think about in this. Okay, because when you read this account, what occurs to almost everybody, and should occur to you, is this. Wait a minute. Isn't God commanding Abraham to do something wrong? And it says not. But you've got to think it through, you see. Um, didn't, for instance, don't, don't we know from Cain and Abel, the brother killing his brother, that killing a man is wrong. Manslaughter, murder is wrong. And child sacrifice. And child sacrifice is wrong. Okay. But now, uh, God commands Abraham to offer his son Isaac. And son left without him. Sorry? And son left, he didn't argue. Yeah, he didn't argue. <laughs> right, he didn't argue. He didn't question God and say, wait a minute, Lord, what about the fact that it's wrong to kill people? He trusted, yes. Do you think he was... Uh, do you think he knew exactly what, what, what was going on? No. Not exactly, no. I think he would have thought, well, this is, a, this is, this is strange. Okay. But he didn't question God. And he understood that God was requiring him to do it. He, it wasn't a question of his choice. He had to do it. God is God. God had told him he must do it. Right? Yes, Molly. But he must have had an inkling that Isaac would come out alive because when they were, before they went up the mountain yeah, and told right. the other people, we go and offer our sacrifice and then we'll come we'll back. Come back. To we will yeah, come back. We will come back. Yes, possibly. Possibly. Yes, sir. The writer of Hebrews says he expected Isaac to be raised. To be raised. In some way. In some way. But I think the key there is. Um, Lots of commentators think, you know, if, if Abraham had actually given up Isaac as a burnt offering, it's, a, it's an atoning sacrifice, yeah. that that would have been wrong. God was wrong to require that of him. But I think, again, we have to think biblically, get the big picture. The soul that sins shall die. Okay? We all deserve to die, to be consumed completely for our sins. And the burnt offering is a picture of the complete destruction of hell for sin. Alright? And I think again, if you think biblically, if it, if it, you know, Paul quotes the language of Genesis 22 in Romans chapter 8, where he says, he's talking about God not sparing his own son, his beloved son, his only son. And that's the language of Genesis 22. Christ died as a burnt offering for our sins. Okay, so when you understand the command in the context of what of the Lord revealing Himself as a Savior and a Redeemer, I think it all fits very comfortably into your heart, to quote Henry Crubb and Love, even if you've still got a few questions in your head. But, so, yes, um, I'm, I'm against those who would criticize the Lord's requirement there. Had he not just destroyed the whole world in the flood? Okay. Do we deserve to be executed for sin? Yes. Did Isaac deserve that? Yes. Did Abram deserve that? Yes. Okay. So that's the bigger context, and I think that's helpful. Yeah, thank you. I think it's essentially it's, it's the right answer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's absolutely the right answer. I would just further point out that there's you know, two things going on. There's one, the bare fact of Abraham killing his son. And then two, there's the question of him offering him up as a sacrifice. Alright, so that can just... And I think what Jim's speaking about when, um, when he's talking about Isaac is a sinner, he's worthy of death. Right? And if the Lord chooses to kill him now, the Lord is not doing wrong. The Lord is killing people all the time. Right? And if the Lord requires that Isaac should be killed by the hand of his own father, yeah. the Lord would be doing justice. 
And then there's of course also the other side, which is the question of sacrifice. But also Abraham might have had in his mind God's promise that through Isaac, many, you know, there'd be a, 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 a posterity that would bless the world. Yes. So his faith would be that if he killed Isaac, God would raise him again. You know, God could do that. Yeah. So there's no reason to doubt God at all. And we may know that the Lord is going to do good. He's going to do the very best in all things. I think people also judge God um, because they, they look themselves up. If you, I was just reading Hosea this morning, and he talks about tearing people apart. You know, the, the language of, of God's judgment is, is very graphic. Yeah. And, you know, yes. and... and if you want to judge him, you know, who are you to tear people apart? But he's God. And he can, he, he, and you see then the extent of man's sin, that God would do these things, and people are deserving. It puts you in your place very easily. Yes, very good. It's more than that, God must. Yeah. But it's also a very uh, good um, example or a, a, a sign of the future of, of um, it, it's going, it's a prophecy that's going to be fulfilled in the real sacrifice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Christ, yes. Yeah. Alright, thank you. I think, uh, I think you, you, you uh, I trust if you've been listening that you're thinking and, and thinking through these issues, some of them at least, and uh, that's good. That's what this time is for, it's for us all to learn from the Lord and His word. Any last question before we close? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time we've had. Thank you for the clear teachings of the Scripture and some issues which are not easy to grapple with, but yet slowly you, you give us light and understanding. And thank you that we can see how good you are, how well and wonderfully you made uh, all things, and that you made all things good. Uh, we accept that and we, we bless you also for your law, which is good. <coughs> We pray that we may submit ourselves to you, understanding that we who are evil uh, are, through Christ, brought into fellowship with the good God. We bless you for that, O Lord. Amen. Amen.